Welcome to United States Farm Report, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this local area. The National Farmers Organization takes pride in inventing a market system to meet the needs of the 20th century, collective bargaining for agriculture. Every American can profit by the successful NFO collective bargaining program for farm income sets the nation's prosperity. United States Farm Report now presents a look at agriculture and its effect on the economy with some of our nation's leaders. Welcome to another edition of U.S. Farm Report. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by the members of the National Farmers Organization in this TV listing area. Uh, I'm uh, Ed Shima from Iowa County, Iowa, and on today's U.S. Farm Report program, we have Mr. Roy Atkinson, who is president of the Canadian National Farmers Union. We're certainly honored to have you on today's program, uh, Mr. Atkinson. And uh, uh, I uh, sort of hesitate to uh, tell the folks where you're from because I really can't pronounce it. Would you mind telling the folks uh, where you're from and uh, so on? Not at all, Ed. I'm delighted to be here. I'm from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I almost had a little trouble myself. Now you see why I couldn't do it. And uh, I'm a grain farmer up there. Uh, I operate uh, a grain farm. We grow all kinds of cereal grains. And I'm also president of the National Farmers Union. Uh, recently, uh, Mr. Atkinson was to the National Farmers Organization Convention at Louisville, Kentucky, where there were over 12,000 delegates. Uh, he uh, spoke to the convention, had some very interesting points to make, and uh, we felt that you would be interested in some of these observations of Mr. Atkinson uh, being a Canadian farmer. Uh, what are some of the problems of the Canadian farmers as you see it, Mr. Atkinson? You know, your organization and our organization defines the problem precisely, the result of new technology, uh, science, uh, etc. And there's a, a conflict, the, the real issue is the conflict between the farmer and his farm and the demands of the industrial sector, which are manifested by Ralston Purina and others. Uh, the, uh, Canadian farmers, of course, I uh, assume have a little bit of a problem of pricing, just as uh, U.S. farmers do. Uh, our our uh, farm situation is such that parity is currently at about 73 percent, and uh, this is uh, w some way too low. And do you have a comparable scale you base your uh, income on or not? Yes, we do, and uh, uh, we're just in the same boat you're in, Ed. Uh, our prices are way down. They've been going down now since 1952. Our farmers in a very difficult income position, uh, and those people that are supplying us with goods and services are making bigger and better profits every year, and we think the time has come to bargain collectively with these birds and getting a little of our own back. Now, uh, as far as your organization is concerned, uh, uh, what has been your uh, primary uh, aims up to this point? Uh, what have you been doing about this? Well, our primary aims uh, to this point uh, uh, have been to uh, alert the farmer as to the nature of his problem, <coughs> to organize him into a, a large organization, uh, to uh, bargain collectively for him uh, in the legislation, legislatures of the country, uh, to uh, form uh, collective bargaining agencies uh, that will bargain on his behalf. But I must confess that we've been like Alice in Wonderland. We've been running as fast as we can to stay where we are. Uh, and I think the, uh, the reason for this is that Canadian farmers and American farmers have not been working with one another nearly as closely as they ought to have been. And we find ourselves from time to time being undercut by the behavior of those people who buy the products that we produce and then manage the market by dumping products in either down here or up there. Uh, in, in other words, uh, it's a situation that one country alone possibly can't handle. It uh, takes more cooperation than... Uh, our cooperation between countries almost to do it. That is absolutely <coughs> correct. Uh, these large-scale international corporations know no boundaries. They know no state boundaries, or the 49th parallel doesn't mean a thing. That's the line between your country and mine, and we just have to work together and play the game the way they do. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I know that, uh, that uh, President Staley of the National Farmers Organization was... Uh, to Canada some time ago and spoke to your group. And uh, in your exchange uh, back and forth, uh, what are some of the things that uh, you feel we might have in common or that we could work on together? Well, we discussed, and I was very pleased to have President Staley come up to Canada to tell uh, our farmers what you people have been doing down here 
with regard to bargaining for prices of farm commodities, uh, to tell them uh, in a general way what you hope to do. And uh, he has uh, made a great impression on our people. And I think as a result of that visit, uh, Canadian farmers are going to be much more actively engaged in protecting the interests of their own farm business than they have been heretofore. The, uh, uh, you spoke at the uh, recent National Farmers Organization Convention at Louisville, and certainly uh, my observation of the crowds and the people uh, visiting with them afterwards was nothing but uh, admiration for the uh, Canadian National Farmers Organization and, and what they were trying to do. Now, uh, at this point, the uh, National Farmers Organization has been real active in collective bargaining and uh, working out uh, supply contracts with the various processors and so on for a better price. And uh, at this point, what has the Canadian National Farmers, or well, uh, Farmers Organization done in I Farmers must Union, I should say, done in along this line? I must say that you're much ahead of us in this respect. Uh, we both operate in a different legislative framework, and being a good business operator, I'm not prepared to put on the record for public view the plans that we have or the things that we have done. I believe uh, that there's no argument like an accomplished fact, Ed, and we're going to confront uh, our joint uh, uh, opponents with accomplished facts from here on in. So you won't mind if I just don't answer that question okay, on the television Okay, uh, that's in other words, it's a little bit of uh, strategy. Uh, this brings up another question. Uh, that uh, comes up quite often as far as the National Farmers Organization is concerned, and how large is your organization? Well, Ed, uh, we're not prepared to uh, tell anyone how large our organization is uh, in terms of its members. All I want to say and repeat again is that we put, we're responsible for putting 25,000 farmers on the Parliament Hill in Ottawa on the 24th day of May, and this is the best kind of language that one can use to demonstrate the power of the organization. It certainly takes an organization to uh, muster folks uh, like that. Now, uh, going on to uh, the Canadian uh, Farmers Union, uh, how old an organization is it and so on? Well, Ed, uh, the Farmers Union today is uh, 19 years old. Mind you, we've had a long tradition, I suppose 60 years of tradition, uh, over which we've changed the name from time to time. Uh, from the Farmers Union to the United Farmers of Canada, back to the Farmers Union, but uh, essentially we're uh, 20 years old. We're just coming of age, Ed. Uh, I, I don't know if we brought this out before, but how long have you been president of the uh, Farmers Union? Well, I've had the uh, uh, privilege of serving as president of the National Farmers Union of Canada for the past three years. And you, uh, your organization elects the president each year, is that right? Yes, we have to stand each year uh, uh, for election. That's one of the criteria uh, of office. Uh, as far as uh, electing uh, the president each year, why, why do you do this? Why don't you have a longer term? Uh, this comes up quite often as far as we're concerned. Why, what are your reasons? Well, I think it's a very important reason, an important reason that's sort of the cornerstone of our democracy, that every officer should... Uh, be in a position that he must stand before the uh, bar of justice, if you will, before the people uh, that he represents, and uh, uh, ask them or have them ask him to stand and uh, to be judged on the merits of his performance. If an officer uh, is not uh, filling the bill, Ed, uh, then uh, the membership always has the right to change. Well, that uh, is real good, and it's a result that keeps the uh, control of the organization in the members' hands uh, uh, real close, and nobody can get a, get too far out of line that way. Then. Well, that, that's true, and that's terribly important. Now, um, you uh, talked in terms of, uh, of the uh, two uh, countries working together and so on. Actually, this is, uh, we call the NFO the National Farmers Organization, and I suppose we're talking here uh, uh, eventually in terms of uh, international farming, and what are some of the... Uh, complications as you and uh, Canada see this in terms of uh, getting better prices for our stuff in terms of the world uh, food situation? Well, Ed, uh, first of all, a uh, major portion of world food production is produced in North America. Uh, North Americans, uh, therefore, have the opportunity in the areas in which they market 
uh, food products, that is the industrially developed areas of the world, to bargain collectively for fair prices. And uh, in terms of our two organizations, let me say this. Until recently, until we have made contact with the National Farmers Organization of the United States, uh, we knew what to do. But until we could see that there was a group somewhere in North America that felt as we did, there wasn't really an opportunity to do it, and that is to bargain for all commodities at a proper price a relationship in order that we overcome the problem that we have experienced in the past where our country may dump or move low-priced commodities into your areas where you're bargaining for prices and break your markets, or conversely, uh, where your commodities would move into our areas and break our prices. For example, I'll give you a very uh, vivid ex description of what's just happened recently, uh, and very few, uh, very small volume of product moving into Canada, and that was turkeys, eight to 10,000 turkeys a week moving in from the U.S. just collapsed our turkey market in Canada, and our turkey producers are in real difficult circumstances. But I want to make uh, this point, that the people who supply the feed that fed those turkeys, they're going to get their bills paid. Yeah, in other words, uh, they'll come out and uh, on this, and uh, I guess the main reason that they'll come out on this is because they're pretty well uh, organized as far as the pricing structure is concerned, and uh, certainly they're not going to, uh, being good business people, they're not going to sell that feed at a loss. That's right. They have lots of security before they take any risk, mm -hmm. and the farmer takes that security. Now, uh, we've uh, run into this just a little bit in the United States. Uh, the uh, NFO some time ago had... Uh, a holding action uh, on uh, meat products, uh, meat animals, and uh, and uh, we run into a situation where uh, we were doing a good job in areas here at home in the United States, but here uh, came in Canadian meat. Well, well, Ed, uh, that's a very serious question that, that you've just raised, but I want to again raise this business of international business organization. Uh, uh, we have a company up there called Swift Canadian. Do you have Swift down here? Yes, we do. Well, uh, it may, and are they your friends, or do you bargain with uh, them? We are working with Swiss in some areas. Right, I think we'll have to work with them in more areas, because I have a hunch that maybe some of that meat was brought in by uh, maybe they or their friends. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you know what happens. Uh, these outfits do, do not bring that meat into your area, and uh, for the purposes of losing on, uh, on the transaction, they bring it in for a margin, and they're going to get paid. But they really foul up your situation. Yes. Now, uh, going on uh, to uh, the uh, general uh, agricultural situation as far as our two countries are concerned, uh, do you have any specific ideas of how we could improve this at, at the moment or in the long-range uh, picture even? Well, Ed, uh, earlier this year I was down uh, to your head office in Corning and talked to President Staley. Uh, we talked about the grain situation. We talked about the drop in the price of specifically wheat. Uh, where uh, our farmers uh, and your farmers are producing wheat and marketing, marketing it to industrially developed countries at low prices, which reflect it themselves in the income your farmers get. Now, we can no longer, as farmers, uh, suffer the luxury of having anyone uh, in the business community or as a result of government policy, uh, dump farm products into international markets, which in effect are, cause a depression in the price of a commodity which reflects itself not only on American farmers, but on Canadian farmers. Because if we continue this behavior, uh, as far as that is concerned, either American farmers or Canadian farmers, and in this instance, Canadian farmers, we're not going to be closed out of the market. We're going to follow you down, and we're not going to sell any more grain in that international market. And so what we, in effect, do is commit economic war on one another. In other words, we cut one another's throats, and nobody makes any money that way. Yes. And the uh, problem that uh, we see is that uh, uh, with the current uh, situation, <coughs> unless we change the situation through better marketing, a uh, very small amount of what some people consider a surplus uh, depresses the market not only on the small surplus, but on all the rest of it. And this has created quite a problem. Uh, well, that's a, key, that's a key question you've raised, Ed, and that is, it doesn't take very much product, 
managed into a key area of a market to break the market right across the board. And this is what we really have to safeguard. And the only way you can do that is when the farmer maintains control of that product. And uh, this is, of course, going to take a, a considerable uh, amount of organization among farmers. Certainly, uh, you mentioned some of the business groups that have done this, and corporations and so on. And uh, certainly pricing their products has worked real well for them. And it probably worked just as well or even better for us, wouldn't it? Well, I've never saw a machine company put a hundred 90 horsepower tractors on a lot and then call in an auctioneer to sell them off. Mm -hmm. And I've never saw a storekeeper uh, put a thousand suits on a rack and say to the consumer, come on in and give me what you will for that product, mm -hmm. you know. So I think uh, what we're really saying here is that the time has come for uh, farmers, whether they live in Canada, the United States, Mexico, uh, Europe, to act like the businessman. Mm -hmm. And that only makes sense. And uh, in all in the world, this uh, amounts to then is farmers uh, uh, bargaining together and selling together uh, in groups. Well, I would put it I would put it in a little different way. I would put it this way: that farmers cannot hope to live off of one another. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to work together, and if they work together, they're going to have to do it as you have suggested. Yes. Now, uh, in the United States, of course, the National Farmers Organization has been active for some time in uh, tying uh, farmers together in a large enough bargaining group to be effective. And uh, you mentioned the situation in Canada where uh, you as Canadians felt you couldn't possibly, uh, probably couldn't do this because of outside influences. And uh, the NFO here has felt that we couldn't do this on a state basis and so on, that we had to do it on a national basis. And uh, in the process of uh, things over a period of time, uh, where we find that the out, uh, outside country, so to speak, can ruin your markets uh, uh, for various reasons, that maybe we should work more closely together. Well, there's no question the beginning of working close together is to talk together. Yes. And uh, as initially uh, we are doing, we have begun or commenced talking together. And uh, again, as good businessmen, we're not going to tell everybody what we're going to do. Uh, we'll cross, the, cross that bridge when we come to it, Ed, yes. and we'll show them rather than talk about it. OK, that, uh, that, that is real good, and we certainly uh, uh, know that uh, an organization that takes this attitude that is going to uh, work aggressively on something is probably going to make quite a few accomplishments. And, uh, and uh, as a result of this, certainly we should be in a position to get better prices not only for, uh, for uh, American farmers, but Canadian farmers too. That's right, Ed. Only through activity can there be learning, and uh, we learn as we go. Uh, there's a great deal of criticism of us for things that we have done, but those who never do anything have nothing to criticize and nothing ever happens. Yes. Uh, I, uh, a, a long time ago when I was a young person, I was uh, uh, working uh, for a, a county uh, doing road work at that time, and I was quite concerned because I was breaking quite a few things, machinery and so on. An old gentleman that was working there said, well, Ed, just don't worry about this at all because if you don't bust anything, you're probably not doing anything. And uh, so uh, as a result, uh, uh, an organization that's doing things and trying to accomplish things and improve things possibly will make a mistake or two along the line, but certainly should not by the mistake. Now, uh, going on uh, a little farther, uh, you were to our national convention recently, and what were some of your observations as far as the, uh, uh, our recent uh, convention? Ed, I was impressed with the number of delegates you've had here. I was impressed with the manner in which they can address themselves to the problems, uh, the way they articulate the, the, their expressions of opinion. I was too impressed with your officers and the way that they spent uh, a great deal of time and energy in making sure that all your delegates have their opportunity to speak on matters of importance to you. Uh, I think, too, I was impressed with the messages that came from the various officers. Uh, the, the material that they presented, uh, probably I was impressed because uh, they are saying the same things as we as farm leaders in Canada in the Farmers Union have been saying to Canadians. Uh, we're concerned about the farmer, and this is true, we're concerned about his level of living, the opportunities of his family in our society, but in addition to that, we're also concerned, as you are, about the state of the nation. 
And uh, as uh, North America goes, uh, so goes the world. I was, I was impressed, too, with the sort of humani humanity that seemed to manifest itself through this whole meeting. In other words, from my point of view, I believe what your leaders have been saying, that people are important, and therefore we rededicate our energies towards serving our fellow man. Uh, it might be interesting to point out to the uh, listening audience that the national, uh, recent uh, national convention, the National Farmers Organization, uh, uh, not only did we have Mr. Roy Atkins from Canada, uh, we also had a Mexican uh, speaker uh, that uh, spoke some on the uh, farm situation. I'm sorry to say I've, uh, he, he had uh, such an accent that I uh, wasn't able to follow him too well, but uh, he had basically uh, made the same points to make that, uh, that you did about as far as the Canadian farmers. I think this just brings into focus another point, Ed. Uh, it seems to me that uh, we as farmers will have to learn that a universal language, either that or would have to become uh, linguistic so that we can speak in all kinds of languages and still understand what each one of was saying. But I think more important than that is, not, uh, notwithstanding the fact it was difficult to follow our friend from Mexico, we could follow what the impressions that he was leaving through his voice, and I think this is a universal language, and we can all feel as farmers for a common cause that's manifested through the sound of voice. The, uh, uh, as far as the uh, convention was concerned, uh, there were a number of uh, decisions made and so on, and as far as you're being an outsider, an observer from Canada, what were some of the more important things that you uh, observed as far as uh, some of the decisions and so on? Well, I think, for example, the... Uh, Amendments to the Constitution, which modernizes it, gives you, gives you the needed flexibility to meet the challenges of the industrial sector or the legislative sector, uh, were terribly important. I think the fact that you re-elected uh, a man like Orrin Lee Staley was, uh, to me, uh, a very significant thing, also your vice president. And I think uh, in sort of summing the thing up, uh, in this situation, you need leadership. You need discipline in the organization, and uh, with the actions that I uh, observed during the last day or two, you've got all these things. The whole decision, of course, remains in terms of the farmer in the country. Your leaders are prepared to do something. Are you prepared to give equally with them? Uh, this is uh, one thing that uh, we're working hard at as far as the National Farmers Organization is concerned, is to build a strong marketing organization and also to... Uh, through uh, programs like you're watching today to uh, bring to you some of the uh, things that we're trying to do and how we're trying to do them. And uh, certainly this is a big job, and, uh, and uh, regardless of whether you're a farmer in uh, western United States or eastern United States or somewhere in between, we certainly think that uh, you should think seriously in terms of uh, doing more about marketing to do a better job of marketing and uh, in terms of uh, not only raising your prices, uh, for your own uh, farming operation, but to help out agriculture as a whole in the United States. And uh, I guess as we look deeper and deeper into this, not only to help agriculture in the United States, but to help agriculture in Canada and probably throughout the world. Now, uh, looking at the world situation, Mr. Atkinson, we have uh, a lot of countries that uh, aren't very developed uh, agriculturally. And uh, it seems in looking at this, probably one of the prime reasons for this is because uh, the farmers simply aren't paid. Uh, very much in these countries. I'm thinking particularly of India as an example. Certainly there's a demand for food, uh, but yet the farmers are in a poor situation. Have you uh, had any particular observations on this? Well, I, w I would say in terms of developing countries, uh, they suffer a number of problems. A, um, they're trying to move into the second half of the 20th century with great handicaps, uh, and insufficient time is being spent uh, with the farmers in those countries in transferring our skills from ourselves to them so that they can produce the commodities that will naturally grow in their countries. I think the other thing that one must say, in terms of my own country, and I can only speak for it, uh, we have some programs going. I don't think sufficient emphasis is being placed upon prices of commodities in the world at levels that do not uh, adversely affect major commodities being produced in such countries as India, Ghana, Nigeria, uh, all other kinds of countries in the world. Uh, because when we injuriously affect a market situation of major commodities, grain, for example, this immediate 
injury is reflected into the price of coffee, uh, cocoa beans, sugar, and in as much as it injuriously affects uh, these commodities price-wise, it also injuriously affects the ability of those developing nations to earn currency with which to A, reinvest in their country for industrial development or agricultural development, or B, buy the products that we have that they so desperately need. And uh, what it amounts to then is the uh, uh, United States and Canadian farmers uh, uh, would uh, raise their general price level, then you would also uh, help the farmers throughout the world theoretically. That's not even theoretical, Ed. That's a practical proposition. Mm -hmm. And until we uh, possess the wisdom to work together towards this objective to the degree that we undercut these nations in terms of low price commodities, we injuriously affect their ability to develop. And also, we destroy some of the investment power that we have invested by way of capital or other things in their country and uh, injuriously affect that investment's ability to earn for those countries and to that effect and to that extent we injuriously affect world development. Mm -hmm. Now uh, going to a little different subject here Mr. Atkinson, now uh, there's been some concern by some people that if we uh, uh, raise the price of the food in the United States that this would raise the price of the consumer and, uh, and uh, so on. Now, we feel that uh, a small raise to the farmer wouldn't raise the price to the consumer very much. It would a little bit, but not very much. And well, being a good businessman, they all go to the consumer to get their uh, better income. And certainly, uh, farmers uh, should do the same thing. And uh, have you had any particular problem with this in Canada? Well, uh, this is the sort of thing the establishment uh, tells us uh, and gives us as gratuitous advice. But I would hasten to add, Ed, that we want to look at the total price of the food package and say that the farm component as a total percentage of food costs is very low. As a matter of fact, it takes less hours of work today to earn sufficient income to pay the food basket than ever in the history of man. And uh, so this is not really a valid uh, uh, objection. Uh, therefore, uh, I see no reason why uh, the farm components ought to be increased and as a matter of fact, the farmers being major users of goods and services that are provided by other sectors of our economy, to this extent, it would add to and aid economic growth in the total economy, something that each of the developing nations and the underdeveloped nations are striving for because gross national product determines your standard of living. Uh, going on to another subject, our time is uh Coming to a close, but just briefly, uh, in the United States, we see a situation that uh, where farmers uh, are squeezed off of the land for the various reasons that uh, we are having a creating sort of a vacuum here. And uh, certainly, somebody needs to farm this land to feed the population. But uh, it's a situation where farmers can't reinvest in it because of the price situation. And you have uh, uh, a situation where you have corporate agriculture coming in. You have this problem in Canada. Andy. Very definitely we do, and the reason for it is that corporations are making profits of such magnitude. They are looking for areas to reinvest these profits, and they have a, an investment advantage that we do not possess. But I would like to go further and say that we do have this trans migration of people from the farms to cities in Canada, uh, and uh, our projection is that by 1980, 80% uh, of Canadians will live in cities. And 70% of those will live in three major cities, which are going, and this trans migration of people is going to create major problems for Canada. We've been visiting with Mr. Roy Atkinson. Uh, we appreciate you being on the program, uh, President of the Canadian uh, uh, National Farmers Union. And uh, we would appreciate a few that are farmers that have not yet joined the NFO, you check farther into the NFO and uh, market and sell through the NFO, and together we can build a strong marketing structure that will benefit all of us. Thank you. United States Farm Report has presented a look at agriculture and its effect on the economy with some of the nation's leaders. 
Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week for more facts on agriculture and rural America, which is the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. Every American can profit by the successful NFO collective bargaining for agriculture, the economic keystone of America.